Okay, good morning. Today is August, August 9th. Okay, and we are going to continue with chapter five. Today we are going to complete the general description of the decomposition. Okay, the structure of the ship is a very complex one, very complex. So one way that we had half in order to analyze is to decompose, right? It's like seeing three aspects, different aspects of the structure. And then the results, we have to put them together, okay? Uh, if you could use finite elements, yeah, you could, you could do it at once. But the problem is that, well, especially when you do the design, right? You don't know the structures. So uh, in that case, we could use some ideas like this one, this decomposition in order to do a, a much simpler analysis, right? And eventually what you can do is you can complement this with a complete full 3D analysis just to check your results, okay? The problem with that you will see next semester is that to develop, to complete the, the model, it takes a lot of time, believe me, a lot of time. Okay? And that's why uh, we leave the, the final, uh, final element uh, analysis of the full uh, whole structure at the end, because it, it takes a lot of time and it's a lot of information coming out that you have to analyze. Okay, so let's continue with this. Uh, and then we will go on with uh, the second part of the of this chapter, which is specifically about the whole beam response. Okay, we see that the hull is very long compared to the beam or to the depth. And that allows us to consider that as a beam. Okay, so in that case, we're gonna have two stresses, normal stresses from uh, bending moments. And also we're gonna have shear stresses from shear forces. So we have to calculate both. Okay, so today we're going to start with that. And there are many details that we would like to, to explain. Okay, let's see if I can find it. Five one. Okay, um, Andy, can you see my full screen? Yes, doctor. Okay, so this is what we are. Explaining so far, okay? So, uh, uh, okay, so we said, okay, we cannot. Doctor, no, it's not in full screen. It's not full screen? No. Now? No, yes. Okay. Okay, so this is what we're. Um, trying to do. We are. Uh, considering first that the hole is very long. So basically, this is a beam. This is what we see the big. Uh, uh, thing that we have to have in mind is that in chapter one and two, we consider prismatic beams. This beam, the hull, it's a beam that has inertia, which is not constant. That's the main difference, okay? So that means that at the, at the forward end, at the aft end, we're gonna have a lower inertia than in the central part, in the midship area, okay? But after that, we could develop an integration in a 1D as a 1D problem, depending only on X. And we can calculate the shear force and bending moment distribution along the length of the beam, of the, of the, the length of the ship. Then we can see, for example, at the bottom, 
that's we have something like this, right? You have the plate, we have longitudinal, we have transversal, right? What we can do is we can represent this as this. This is a grillage, right? So each one of these, for example, okay, is welded to the plate. So what we can do is we can represent the combination of this plus some uh, plating as the inertia for this. Similarly, for in the other direction. Okay, this element has a certain inertia, uh, but we have to include the piece of the plate to which it is welded. We calculate the inertia, and this is the this is this thing here. After that, we apply the loading, and we can uh, calculate this uh, the response of this structure. We have to be careful with this, people, because usually. Usually in this case, uh, let me write just, uh, because it's something which is. Okay. Oh shoot, that's not correct. Today. This is the plate. Okay. This is the reinforcement like this. The neutral axis will be very close to the plate. Okay. That means that this distance, okay, from here to here, that's what we call C. That's the distance to the largest, to the farthest fiber, okay? So the stress at the top is going to be much higher than the stress at the plate, okay? So uh, what I'm trying to say here is that when we have to combine, okay, uh, this is a very special case, right? So the distance from here to here is much larger than the distance from here to here. So the stress in the flange of this stiffener is going to be much larger than the stress at the plate. Okay, so when we combine, okay, here usually what we consider is the stress at the plate. Okay, so the stress at the plate, it's a combination of these plus that. Yeah, but the stress in the case of the secondary is very small. Very small. Actually, basically, what we do is we consider this little piece of plating between stiffness. That's what we have here, okay? And this is basically uh, chapter four, okay? Uh, as we explained last session, uh, since we have two type of framing systems, right? In this case, this is what we call the uh, transverse framing system. You see that this distance, this and that, this distance here, it is distance between the stiffness. And this to here, the distance from here to here, that the distance between girders. This longitudinal in this case are much stronger. And in this case, we know from chapter four that the direction in this direction, in the X direction, we have the larger uh, plate stresses. In this case, this is the longitudinal framing system. These are going to be the larger uh, bending moments. So we're gonna have uh, larger normal stresses in the y direction. So in this case, in the x direction, we have a very high normal tertiary stresses, which is also the direction in which the primary stresses occur. So for this case, these stresses are going to be combined with this one. In this case, the normal stresses in the y direction, they're orthogonal to this direction. 
So the combination we have to be done, but uh, using, for example, uh, another criteria, and we will review that. Okay. So all of that has to be in your mind when you start analyzing the, the three uh, components and put them together. Okay, this is the primary. We said something about that. Okay. And uh, so we have, uh, we're going to review this in a minute. So we have weight and we have pressure. This is uh, the, not only the dynamic, but also the high static pressure. Okay. So this and that are not equal. That means that it's going to, we're going to have an acceleration and that's this inertial load, okay? So we have the three, pressure, static and dynamic, weight and inertial, and the three will produce a P function. That's force per unit length. Then we integrate along the length of the ship and we could have a bending moment in shear force. We're going to insist on that. Uh, forces here and, and shear force and bending moment here are going to be zero. And that's why our, our conditions. And in here, I insisted that you can see that on the, this is port side, you have upper forces. On the, the starboard side, you have low uh, downward forces that will produce a torsion. And that's, that's because in some cases you have the, the waves coming in oblique directions, and that produces this type of uh, behavior, okay? So the beam, okay, will sustain vertical bending, lateral bending, and also some torsion. But we are going to consider only vertical bending, which is usually the most important problem, okay? For the loading, we are going to insist on that. Since this is a, a 1D problem, this is just force per unit length, okay? And to calculate the buoyancy, this is what we do, okay? The, the force in this, uh, in this small uh, segment, delta x length, is equal to the volume times the gamma. This area is the transfer area of the section, okay? And in, since this is the 1D problem, we have to include forces per unit length. So uh, this is what we call little b. So this is force divided by unit length, and this is what we obtain, okay? So as you can see, this is force per cubic length. This is length squared. So the result's gonna be force per unit length. Uh, okay, now we have to go on now. In the case of the secondary now, uh, this is what we call a grillage, okay? Uh, we have to be careful because there are some, some, some times there's some confusion in the notation, okay? So let's, let's consider people two situations, okay? Let's suppose something like, we have something like this, okay? This is clamp here, this is clamp here, okay? And this, let's suppose this is x-axis and this is y-axis. And we have a force like this, like this. And you see that the forces that we have, okay, this is force one, this is force two. You see that force one and force two, they have components only in the x and y plane. Okay, and of course, as a result of these forces, there's going to be some uh, deflection. Okay, so they are going to deform like this. I don't know, maybe something like this and something like this. Okay, because of the of the loading. So you see that this is a problem in the plane. Now, we could also have a two D problem like this one here. Okay. And I, I have had problems with my. So this is X. This is Y. Okay. Let's put another reinforcement here. Okay. But now 
let, let me change color so you see the difference. But now the force is going to be like this. Okay? So you see the difference, people? In the upper case, the forces were in the same plane as the elements. In the lower, this is what we uh, have when we have loading which is perpendicular to the XY plane where you have these elements, okay? So the upper one, some people call it a grid, G-R-I-D, or a plane frame. Uh, let me see if I can write this. Strange with this thing. Too. The upper one. This is what we call a grillage. Okay. And this is what we call a grid. Plane. Frame. Okay, so we're talking about grillage. So we have a group of elements in a plane, could be the XY plane, and the loads, the forces are perpendicular to the plane. I have a program, well, not, uh, it's not mine. It's a, it's a program that we implemented from the appendix of the, one of the final element class uh, books. And they, they handle both type of problems, grids and, uh, and, and grillages. Okay, so we have to be careful. So we work with, in this case, we model the secondary as grillages. Okay, so as, as groups of, of, of beams in one plane and the loading, the loads, the forces are perpendicular to that. Okay, so uh, yes, as uh, you can read here, the stiffeners and the gilders, uh, they have some uh, plating attached to the grillage, okay? And uh, at the end, they, were, they are connected to either the sides or the uh, bulkheads, okay? So that's what we have as a secondary structure, okay? For example, here, uh, I'm sure I'm trying to show here is that uh, we have a we have a, a structure So we have an structure which has been deformed like this one here. This deformation, Okay, you see that it is not straight, right? The deck. That's because it, it suffered a longitudinal, a primary deflection. So this, what I'm showing you here with this, this dotted line, okay, non-continuous, this continuous line, this is what we call the primary deformation. And you can see that the, the structure between this and that, these are uh, both heads, this structure has deformed a little bit more. And this is what we call the, de the secondary deformation, okay? For example, here is a photograph from a ship that uh, we visited some, some years ago here in Guayaquil. Yeah, you see this is the transfer in the bottom. This is the longitudinal, okay? You see that this is a bulkhead. head. And you see here, the bottom is flat. You see here that we have a chine, right? And you can see here a little bit of a longitudinal uh, bulkhead probably. Now, question for you people, is this a longitudinal or transfer framing system? Is this a longitudinal or transfer frame framing system people? What do you say? Mr. Vanegas, what can you say? Is it longitudinal or transfer framing system? Uh, 
No, Mr. Paredes, what do you say? Is this longitudinal or transfer framing system? Mr. Paredes, Luis Paredes. <clears throat> Mr. Paredes, can you hear me? Come on, don't make me waste time. <sighs> Mr. Soria, what do you say? Anybody, raise your hand. Is this longitudinal? Right. Okay. What? Transfer. Is it transfer? Transfer. No. transfer, transfer, because we have a very strong, we have a very strong longitudinal. And the transfer, you see that the distance between transfers, for example, just as, as a general uh, idea, what would be the spacing between transfer cells, between the stiffeners, transfer stiffeners? What do you say, more or less? Any idea? Give me a number. Uh, 75 centimeters. Yeah, a little less than that, maybe about 60. 65. About, about, yeah, about 60, yeah. I, I don't remember exactly, but it was about that. Okay, so please, let's start getting those numbers in your head so you can start comparing. Similarly, for example, would you give me the spacing between longitudinals, more or less? The space between longitudinals. That would be the distance between this one here and this one here, this distance. Anybody? Please give me a number. Between girder or longitudinals? Between, between the girders. One half meters. Oh. See, the, if this is 60 or 65, so this is about three times, so it's about 1.5 or something like that, more or less, maybe a little bit more than that. So you just start making things, physical idea in your head. Okay, that's that's what I'm trying to, to ask you. Okay, so you see that we have transfers, we have longitudinals, okay, they are very well uh, supported by, in this case, a, a transfer bulk head beside longitudinal bulk head. So we could analyze, we could convert this into a group of transfers in one longitudinal. If we, we could apply load and we can calculate stresses. Okay, that's the secondary structure. And finally, there, Shari, uh, well, you can imagine, uh, In this case, we have something like, uh, we have, uh, you see, th there are two lines here. One is this, which is uh, this one here. This is not continuous. And in between this and that, there is some extra deflection. And that's what we call the tertiary deflection. Okay, so remember we have primary, and, and you can identify between these two uh, uh, ball heads, right? So you have extra deflection because you have to consider the deflection of the, of the secondary panel. And then between stiffeners, you could have extra deflection of the plating. That's a tertiary deflection. So each one of these uh, components generates some sort of uh, stresses and we have to um, combine in a very efficient way, because it's not just a matter of calculating sigma one, sigma two, sigma three, and just adding, no. Because the directions are very important, and not only, not only that, but also where those uh, stresses occur is very important too, okay? Now, this is as a summary. So the plates, they develop primary and secondary stresses, but these, stresses are in the mean point, in the midpoint of the thickness. That means that the, those two are considered as uniform, okay? Now the tertiary, which is also developed in the, in the plates, remember that when we studied chapter four, we included kinematic assumption. So in the thickness, 
there was a linear variation of the stress. So we have to keep that in our mind, okay? So this is what we're saying, okay? In the, in the, uh, on the left-hand side figure, we, we had uh, the primary behavior. So let's suppose that we analyze the, the plating in the bottom. In this case, you see that we have the thickness. In the thickness, the primary stress is uniform, right? Similarly for the secondary. So let's suppose that this direction is X, okay? This is the plating. And because of the deflection, the secondary deflection, <clears throat> the, pl the, the plate <clears throat> develops some stress. But we assume that in the thickness, okay, the stress is going to be similar to this one. It's going to be uniform. In the tertiary component, this is the thickness. Of course, this is a zoom, okay? In, in this case, the, the thickness, there is a variation, linear variation of the stresses. And you see that this is a linear variation. So for example, I have compression here, just as an example, I have compression here, both in the X direction, in the uh, bottom plate. But here, in the top of the plate, I have compression. In the bottom of the plate, I have tension. So we could consider that in the top of the plate, of the bottom, of the bottom plating, this, this and that is going to add. In the bottom, these, these are negative and this is tension positive. So they're going to subtract, okay? So we have to have all of these things in our mind, okay? Any other, any, any question people, any question? What happened with the other direction? Uh, similar, for, for example, in the y direction, there is no primary stress or there's going to be very small, right? In the y direction, the, 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 you see the shift like this, right? And it flexes, deforms like that. But in this direction, in the y direction, basically there's nothing. So one component is going to be null. So, yeah, yeah, there could be some problems, but uh, in general, we do not expect to be that that's such a big problem because sigma primary y or, or yeah, y is going to be zero. Okay. Okay. Uh, the reinforcement elements could be stiffeners, could be girders. They develop primary stress, yes, because uh, when we calculate <clears throat> the inertia, <clears throat> okay? We consider the uh, longitudinal elements. If we consider those in the, in the calculation of the inertia of the, of the whole, that means that they are, con they are developing stress, longitudinal stress, primary stress, okay? Uh, and secondary, yeah, because they, they bend, okay? When we analyze acrylage, Okay, we have something like this with the plating and we apply the load and they deform. So the longitudinal elements will support primary stresses and also could develop uh, secondary stresses. It makes no sense to consider them as a tertiary because it's, it's just plating, okay? Now, something which is very important is that uh, uh, according to the type of uh, Frame system, right? Uh, you will see that in the classification society rules, okay? When uh, you have a certain type of framing system, they ask you to calculate the possibility of buckling, the buckling strength, right? Why is that? Because that depends on the aspect ratio. And we will compare this in a second, okay? So we're, we're going to say a couple of words about that. Okay, here, this is just a summary of the problem, okay? So here we have, this is a rectangular plate supporting a load 
uniform load on these two edges. And in this case, we see that uh, the loading is below the critical. No deflection, and you see that here, the, the plate is flat. So there is no deflection, there is no lateral deflection. But here, we have reached the critical value. And in this case, even though this is a, a, an homogeneous problem, we have some deflection in the vertical direction, right? After that, basically, we cannot take more strength from the plate. We cannot increase its strength. So it, it's very important for us to calculate the possibility of buckling, okay? And this is what we read, in, for example, in the BNB rules, okay? They say that uh, the critical has to be calculated for transversely stiffened plate, okay? And why is that? Because in when you have a rectangular plate, I'm, I'm trying to draw here. Let, let me see if I can do it. Because I'm having problems with my, my thing here. Damn it. See, let's support, ah, Jesus Christ. Let's suppose we have something like this, okay? And then we have something like this, okay? Okay, so we have two rectangular plates. So the first one here, this is transverse, and this is longitudinal framing system. So because of the uh, physics, uh, the transfer uh, framing system the, or, or, or a plate in a transversely framing system has lower, lower buckling strength. That means that the, the buckling stress, the critical buckling stress is much lower than in the low, in the in the longitudinal framing system. And that's why the uh, classification society rules recommend to check the possibility of buckling, okay? So for those of you who are going eventually to ship design and you design a ship with a transfer framing system, that's something that you have to do. Check that the plating does not su suffer from buckling, okay? And this is the way they, they uh, they do it. Let me try to erase this because I did. You have to calculate this sigma e. Okay, this sigma is this thing here. So this is specifically for steel. So here we have uh, this 2.3. Remember that in the case of the of the of the steel, John modulus is two point something, right? So more or less that's the idea behind this, because this is multiplied by pi squared. So pi is three point. 14, and when you square it, okay, eventually you get one point something. That's why you get 2.3. More or less, that's the idea. But what I'm trying try, try to insist here is that this is specifically for uh, steel, right? And that depends on the thickness here, thickness minus TK. TK is the corrosion allowance, okay? So you have to reduce, okay? The, see, when you install a, a, a plate on the ship, right? Uh, you paint it and all of that. Yeah, but after a few months and years, you can expect that the corrosion will affect. So originally it was eight, but uh, after two years, that will be probably seven millimeters in thickness. 
So you have to consider that it's being reduced. Okay, that's the corrosion allowance. Okay, and S and L are the spacing. S is the minimum spacing, that's the spacing between stiffness. L is the spacing between girders. So S over L is the aspect ratio of the plate. And as a result of that, you will have the critical sigma, which is this one here. So that's the critical stress, okay? But it, it, I insist, this is specifically for transfer frame it system, okay? Uh, now, after you calculate sigma E, okay, you have to check if sigma E is higher than 0.5 of the yield point. That means is that what we consider is like a, uh, like a short cone. Right. In the case of short cone, we cannot expect to have a failure because of uh, buckling, but we get too close to uh, yielding. In that case, we apply this formula here, where sigma yielding is the yield point, and sigma sub e is the value that we calculated. Okay, so that's that's the way this is applied. If it is not the case, we can take simply sigma e as the critical value. That, that's it's very simple. And here you have an example in the class notes. This is a transfer framing system. It, the spacing between stiffness is 30 centimeters. I, I'm always saying that I should uh, <clears throat> update this example with more realistic values between for this spacing. But anyway, uh, so I put this rectangle like this, and then I move it like this. And I'm just comparing the, the strength of both cases, right? So it's a 30 by 120, but like this or like that. Okay, in this case, you see that this is the, the side where you apply the transfers. And since the side is longer, of course, the effects is going to be much higher. And that's basically the reason why in this case the, the strength is much smaller than in this one okay and you can calculate this is in the class notes and in this case the criti critical stress is this value and in this case is is this value so this is very close to the to the yield point in this case this is very low compared to the yield point uh, this was my old class notes because you can see the units, right? We should use um, uh, newtons and millimeters. Okay, so that's the last message about comparing these these two framing systems. Okay, so as a summary, when you have <clears throat> the design to design the ship, the, the structure of a ship, uh, we have to select the framing system. Okay, and each one has its advantages. But in the case of the transfer framing system, you always have to check the possibility of the buckling of the deck or bottom plating. Okay, and that's uh, this application. You can review it in the class notes. Any, any, any questions about this people so far? <clears throat> any question people? <clears throat> <clears throat> no? Okay. That's uh, hopefully in the second. Um, hey, can you see my full screen? Yes, Doctor. Okay. okay, so this is the complete uh, content of this chapter, and we have uh, reviewed so far the first one here, 5.1. So let's go to 5.2 now. In 5.2, okay, we're going to spend some time, but we have to be uh, very uh, aware. We have to be aware that, in general, primary behavior is a problem related to large ships. Okay, when you talk about 
and small ship 30, 40, 50 meter long, usually primary behavior is, is it's not important, okay? Primary stresses are, are going to be very small. So we shouldn't worry about that. And the special situation are the barges, okay? In general, the barges, remember, okay, they are have a large beam and a small depth. So in that case, it's gonna be a little bit uh, different, but in general, in general, you have a small ship, we shouldn't worry about that. But it's something which is very interesting. And eventually, hopefully you will be able to face some of these because you, you start dealing with larger ships, okay? So that's that. And you can see in the title, right, 5.2, that it's not only normal, but also shear stresses that we have to worry about. Okay, because uh, remember that the length to the depth of a ship is not higher than 10. That means that the shear stresses are important and we, sh we should uh, worry about them. We should calculate them, okay? Let's, let's go. Okay, so <clears throat> this is figure that uh, we should have in your mind. Uh, you see that that is a very long ship, container ship, very long, and it's basically it, it's broken, right? That that's the result of the primary uh, response. Probably there was some crack, initial crack, that reduced its strength, and eventually loading took them to that situation. Okay, so this is the basic. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, what is C? C is the distance from the neutral axis to the uh, farthest fiber. Okay, because yeah, we want to uh, analyze the largest uh, stresses, right? So C is the dis largest distance from the neutral axis to any fiber in the section. Okay, we're going to say something about that in a second. Inertia. That's a very long process in this case, since we have a lot of elements in the section, okay? Um, in this case, I, I, was, I, I didn't have the time to draw a complete uh, figure, but what I'm trying to say here is that, uh, Okay, but I'm, I'm, I'm saying here is that, remember, this is a beam, and this is what we are saying here. In this case, we are analyzing, okay? And we have longitudinal elements, in this case, the, the deck, and we have this web, right? Or this flange and this web. And we also have transverse elements. And this is something that causes problem usually, right? When we uh, develop the, the calculation for the inertia, we have to consider that this distribution of the stresses is that we are analyzing. And we're analyzing only elements, we're going to include in only elements that develop normal stresses in the X direction. So you see that this transverse element here that I see here and here, these are transverse elements, they don't develop normal stresses in the X direction. Probably they develop stresses in the Y direction, but that's not what I'm analyzing here. I'm analyzing stresses in the X direction, okay? So this is the message here. Transverse elements do not contribute to the, the longitudinal strength of the whole beam, okay? So please keep that in your mind, okay? For example, here, this is uh, developed by uh, engineer Moreno some years ago, uh, and we have some uh, elements here, right? It's in Spanish. Um, 
which elements of this do you think we have to be included to calculate the inertia I sub C? Uh, for example, you see here, we have a bow, okay? Does it transfers reinforcement? We call it in, in, in English would be deck frame, okay? So this bow will support the load on the deck, like this one here. Uh, we put some load and that would help to support that. Do you have to consider that deck frame to calculate the inertia in the primary behavior? Mr. Benavides, what do you say? Um, I do not hear we want to consider that too. <laughs> okay, Mr. Chin Chin, what do you say? Uh, I think um, we consider this value in the inertia. No, no. Why not? Because that's in the y direction. So you have a transverse and you have a longitudinal. Only longitudinal elements have to be considered. Okay, so the main element is plating. Because the plating, for example, in this figure, you see that the flange is plate. So the flange contributes a lot, a lot to the inertia. Okay, so when you have to, to in, increase uh, the inertia, for example, to increase the thickness of the, of the deck or bottom, increases dramatically the inertia. But that's a longitudinal element. In the, in the transfer direction, they don't contribute, but they do not develop sigma x stresses, okay? So any longitudinal elements, all of these longitudinal elements, these, these little elements that you see here, 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 yeah, this, the plating in the bottom, the plating on the side, the longitudinal reinforcements in the bottom, in the side, they also contribute, but not the transfer elements. They do not contribute to the longitudinal strength. Okay, now something else, right? Uh, probably you have seen some uh, ads of a container ship, right? It is possible that you, you have seen some of that. And the problem is that you have the, the ship like that, the section, here you're supposed to have the deck. But what happens with the deck? There is no deck. What happened in that case? But in certain parts, you could have the deck. But in certain other parts, you have basically open. Okay? So you have these changes, for example. And in that case, we have to be careful with the calculation of the inertia. Okay? So what the, the rule says, the classification rule says, is that we have to include to calculate the inertia all longitudinal elements. I included quotation marks because th those two words are uh, directly from the classification rules, okay? Now, if you have a hole in the deck, for example, classical in a fishing vessel, right? You have the deck, you have a hatch, that's a hole, so you can take the load by the hatch and store it below the deck. But this is a hole, so before, and after you have plating, but not here, this is a hole. But the problem is that normal stresses, right? They do not just go up to here and it stop and become zero, right? That by common sense makes, uh, so this is what we, we, or not we, that's what the classification rules recommend, right? You have a hole, okay? You have to consider that this and that, those are inactive zones. That means that those zones should not be included in the calculation of a the sectional inertia, okay? And that's, uh, this angle here is 30. So if you have a hole, you have to draw this triangle with these 30 degrees in this area, which is crossed in this, uh, in this figure, should not be included in the calculation of the sectional inertia, okay? Um, 
yeah, usually if this is typical for, for fishing vessels, right? In that case. Okay, so with all of this in, in, our, in our head, we could go on and, and take uh, the experience that we developed in chapter one, when we calculated the sectional inertia of a composite section. Okay, remember, we have a big table with many elements, okay? We have a description and then we go, uh, if we can analyze each one of them as a, as a rectangle, we could identify the, the, the beam, the height of each element, the position with respect to the baseline, which is the most common. And then we go area, area times D, uh, area times D squared, and then in the inertia. Then we add them up, and then how we can, before we go to the, uh, the first break, uh, how do we uh, calculate the inertia from the neutral axis with respect to neutral axis? Does anybody remember the formula for that? After you have all of these summations, uh, Ms. Poveda, do you remember the formula for to calculate the inertia with respect to neutral axis? Ms. Poveda, <clears throat> do you remember the formula? Ms. Poveda, are you there? Uh, Mr. Dominguez, do you remember the formula to calculate the inertia with respect to neutral axis? Yeah, doctor. It's a summation of inertias plus oh. summation of the area by d squared. Times d squared, and then? Minus the summation minus. area by the centroid to the to square. Exactly, d, d average squared. Okay, so, but in this case, you can imagine, right? You have, so you have the depth, you have the side, and you see here, there is some part of the side which is vertical, another which is a little bit inclined, and the other is the bottom, which is more inclined, right? And then we have, basically, we can consider that the, all the uh, longitudinals in the deck are in the same uh, vertical position. But you are, if you are precise, yeah, because of the camber of the deck, we should put each one of them at its own D, the distance from the baseline. Then the longitudinal is on the side, each one has its own position, and then you have to start adding them up. So it's, it's a long process, a very long table, but that's something that we should do, right? Because we practice this in chapter one. Okay, people, uh, let's take a break here, 804. Um, Andy, could you please stop the recording?